Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, if, if you want. I'll be reading Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. That's Matthew 4, 1 through 11, and I'll be reading out of the New American Standard Bible. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, He said to him, All these things I will give to you, if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Thank you, Adam. It's great to be able to worship with you guys. We were gone last week to Angel Fire, New Mexico. They have a Bible symposium, and... Uh, I was able to speak out there, but I'm glad to be back here and glad to be able to worship with you guys. What a great thing it is to have such a congregation and to see all the smiling faces and uh, realize all the good things we're doing. We packed bags for teachers this week. Hopefully uh, you knew about that and you, a lot of you brought things just to be able to share with the teachers. and. Uh, so we're going to take these to three different public schools if we have enough. And just to be able to say we believe in what you're doing and that we want you to be able to do a good job and we realize you don't have enough resources and so we want you to know we're praying for you and that we have some resources that we wanted to share. Now if you came on Friday night and your kids helped pack a bag, your kids could take one to their teacher. If you're here today, please don't take one. <laughs> because these are all reserved for the school and this is part of our outreach and so I'm not trying to be mean, but uh, this is part of the outreach of what we're trying to do in taking some to uh, the public schools around here. You gotta make an influence in the community. And so that's part of what we're trying to accomplish with all of these things. We want to start talking about something new, and that is about time with God. What does that really mean? How do we get time with God? And so the first one is alone time. What do you think of when you think of alone time? Maybe you're like me. You think there's a circle on the wall and I'm supposed to put my nose in it. Or I'm sitting in a chair facing the wall and I've still got four and a half minutes to go. It's called time out, but that's not what we're talking about today. Uh, we're talking about something different today because there is an alone time that we're able to have with God and there is an alone time that is an incredibly good thing. And so it's not just a matter of the time when you got in trouble, now you're isolated. And uh, you know, sometimes that doesn't work. We had one of our kids where you could send him to his room. You have to stay in your room. Great. Got all these toys to play with. We sent the other one to his room and it was horrible. No, there's nobody there. All, all alone. And so I don't know how you are, whether you think of alone as a good thing or whether you think of alone as a bad thing. Does it seem like punishment? Does it seem like, yay, I finally got rid of the two-year-old, so now I, I can have some alone time. And, you know, if you want to know about somebody who's happy to have alone time, it's parents of young children. 
For a lot of us, though, it gets to be a time of fear. It's a time where it's too quiet. We get scared. We need a distraction. We don't like it. We, we don't want to be alone. We want to have somebody else around, somebody else that we know is going to be there. And so let's start today with what happened with Jesus when he has some alone time. So Adam has read the account of what happens when Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness in order to be tempted by the devil. I mean, it's very specific. God said, you are going to have some alone time. The Spirit pushes him there, drives him there, says you need this time alone. And it's not a pretty place where he goes to. He's going to the wilderness. Not only is there no people there, there is nothing there. There is nothing else there. It is a desolate place. And he sends him to a desolate place on purpose so that there are no other distractions. There no, is nothing else that's going on. And it's a time for a test. It's a time for a temptation in order to figure out what we will do. And he goes 40 days without food. That's got to be an incredible amount of time. I mean, we can't hardly make it till lunch. Don't, don't worry, we, you know, we're on good track here. We won't be late today, so your lunch is safe. But what would that feel like if you didn't get lunch today or tomorrow or the rest of the week or dinner or for 40 days? That's a long time not being able to eat anything. And of course, the first temptation he says is, why don't you turn stones to bread? I'm sure by that time, it looks like bread. I mean, those stones are something that, you know, well, maybe I could take just a little bite. And he has the power. That's not the problem. He could do it. But he refuses to use his power on himself. Because if he starts using his power on himself, then what's the point? It's just all selfishness. And his example to us would be a matter of, well, God's got great power. Become a Christian so that you can make your life happy and you can get all the bread you want and you can eat as much as you want and that's not his ministry. That's not the way God does it. And so when you begin to look at how Jesus' ministry is going to turn out, it's a matter of him being able to teach other people and say that, you know, suffering is important. And there are times when you do without for God. And there are times when you have to realize that we're not going to be able to get everything we want but we are willing to sacrifice for God to the point where he would even give up his life. And so you realize in this situation, doesn't that make it different? I mean, if you're starving to death, wouldn't it be okay? And it's almost set up for this is the way it's going because after all, here you are and it's been 40 days and he's not gonna be a good Messiah if he dies before he even starts. So you might as well, a little bit of situation ethics there of saying, you know, if you're in a bad enough situation, then you ought to, and Jesus says, no. I live by the word of God, and I live by that alone. I am not going to use God's power just for myself. Well, the second one is about safety. God will protect you. And he takes him to a high place, pinnacle of the temple. Not this one. And he says, if you throw yourself down, God will protect you. It will be that he will bear you up. He even has a, a scripture to be able to say this. And Jesus says, no, I do not put God to the test. I realize he's putting me to the test. And there are times when we need to be tested. And he gives us this example saying, you realize you need to be tested so that you know you can overcome it. Because you walk out with so much power, so much more in your life that you're able to do because you know what you can do now. 
And he says, so I am not going to do that. And the third one, he says, is let me just give you everything. Let me just fulfill your, your ministry. Don't, doesn't the end justify the means? We hear that a lot, right? As long as you get the result that you want. He says, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. That last scripture you're going to talk about, all authority in heaven and on earth will be given to me, has been given to me. Well, you can say most all of that. All authority on earth has been given to me because I have all the kingdoms and you don't have to die. And there's no sacrifice and there's no place where you're going to have to go through all this suffering and rejection and beatings and everything else. He says, you don't have to go through any of that. Let me make it easy for you. And anytime somebody says, let me make it easy for you, be suspicious. He says, it's just one little catch. I just need you to worship me. And Jesus says, no. All honor goes to God. And I do things the way God would do them. I do not take shortcuts. It is not the end justifies the means. And he walks out of those temptations so much stronger. Luke's version says, in the power of the Spirit. Wow. Because he went through temptation, because he went through hard time. And that's what you do with alone time. I think God put him there on purpose. Has God put you there on purpose sometime? Maybe you didn't recognize it as that. Because it just seemed like it was, well, I'm all by myself now, and I don't... I hope this goes away soon and I find more friends, but, you know, it might be a time when God is using that because that's not always a bad time. It's a time that shows who you are. It's a time where you get to say, here's what I believe and here's what I think and here's what I do, because most of the time we react out of habit. I mean, this is what we have to do for the day. You get up and there's clothes to be put on and washing that has to be done and work that you have to go to and then you come back home and there's TV that has to be watched and, well, maybe not, but anyway, you know that's just your habit because you sat down and you're tired and here we are and then we get up the next day and we do it again and we do it again. And we, Why do we do it that way? Because we did it that way yesterday. Because somebody wants us to do it that way. Because somebody's expecting those things from us. And that happens every single time, doesn't it? If you've got children, your children expect you to organize around them. If you're married, your spouse expects you to organize around them. But if you're alone, you could do it any way. But you find out when family's gone, you end up lost. <laughs> what do I do now? I have no one to organize around because I always organize around my children or my spouse or somebody else and what they have to do, and it just doesn't work that way. It lets you know who you are. It lets you know what's best. If no one fussed at you, would you still do it? If your wife never told you what you were supposed to do, would you still do the things she wants you to do? I know, interesting question. You know what's right. You know the best path. If no one's going to tell you different, would you still do it? See, morals and ethics and righteousness are not just because someone is watching. They're what we do when no one is watching. And if you could get away with it, I mean, we would know and God would know. I mean, you can't get less than that. But if you could get away with it, what would you do if you knew you could commit a sin and nobody else would know? Not a single other person would ever know. You would never be found out. Because you would make sure, you know, you threw the wrapper away instead of leaving the candy bar wrapper out. You would make sure you covered your tracks and no one else would ever know. Would it be okay? It makes us different people. 
whether somebody else knows or not, it makes us different people. What makes Jesus righteous is what he does when no one is looking. Because if you're going to do that when no one's looking, when you could get away with it, it doesn't mean that's who you are. It means you're fake. It means you're not real with yourself. The same thing makes us righteous. We're either sinners or righteous. What makes the difference? Well, it's when we don't get caught, right? No, that's not what makes the difference. What makes the difference is who you are when you're alone. Whether you're holy or unholy, whether you're saved or lost, it's what we do when we're alone. Do not just do what you can get away with. That's a terrible way to live your life. If there's no outside evil influence, would you do it? No evil desire is pushing you to do that? Well, okay, maybe not. What if there's no good desire? There's no one to say, this is what's good to do. Then would you still do it? Because you believe in it? Because it's right? Because it's what God wants? Would we do it then? Interesting dilemma, isn't it? What would you do if no one else knew? I think everybody has to answer those questions because there's times when you're going to be alone. And that's the time when God says, okay, here's the test. Now what do you do? You're out of town. Do you still go to church? You're on vacation. Do you still have to go to church? I mean, certainly not Bible class, just the communion part, right? And then you can sneak out before the sermon. Okay, y'all, you guys who are walking out now, you're already too late. Sorry, your, your sermon's already started. What do we do then? Let me give you the other side of this. The first side is Jesus in the wilderness, and he says, no, I don't do it that way. Here's the other side. Mark chapter 5. And just the setup of the story, speaking about Jesus and his disciples, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. And he lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he had wrenched the chains apart and broken the shackles in pieces. And no one had strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and he fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. That's quite a contrast, isn't it? Because here's a guy who nobody tells him what to do. It isn't that nobody's tried. I mean, everybody's tried to tell him what to do, but nobody can enforce it. Nobody can make him. Nobody can force him into doing this because, after all, he has an unclean spirit. He's demon-possessed. It may not be his fault. Although it may be also, there's some indication demons didn't possess people who were righteous and holy before God, but I'm not sure all the details about exactly who got it and who didn't in Jesus' time. That seems to be more for our time. But he's alone with evil. And I think we're either alone with evil or we're alone with God, because we make a choice there. And alone with evil means you don't have to wear clothes. You don't have to live in a house. You don't have to clean up anything. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be in town. You don't have to be nice. You can scare as many people as you want to. And you are the biggest, baddest, meanest guy in town. And nobody will mess you with you. You go to the gym and everybody's scared of you. Because you are the strongest guy in the whole gym actually anywhere, because nobody's going to do that. He is the baddest guy around, and he can do anything he wants to that evil will let him, because there's the catch. No one can tell him what to do, but what does that get us? It gets us crazy in the graveyards, what it gets us. 
And that's where you end up. You say, but I didn't want to go there. But if you don't want to do anything good ever at all for anyone, it gets you crazy in the graveyard. He didn't need drugs to get there. He's out of his mind. He has no control anymore because now evil has come in and evil controls him and he doesn't have a say. We think, well, if I could just do what I wanted, most of us would give it over to evil and evil would do what it wanted. It wouldn't really be us anymore. It wouldn't be doing what we wanted. And the sad part is a lot of people today want to go there. They want to be where I can do just as much evil as what I want to. I don't want to have to try to be good. And we destroy ourselves and our relationships and any chance of goodness or relationship with God. And it's a trap. It is a trap and we can't get out. Use your alone time well. It makes us crazy when we don't follow God, and when evil comes in, and when evil is there. The end of the story is a better end, because he casts all the demons out, kind of destroys the local economy, but he casts all the demons out, and for the first time, the guy is clothed and in his right mind and sitting at the feet of Jesus. I saw this. One of the best gifts we can give ourselves is time alone with God. One of the most beneficial things. That's where a lot of relationships begin, if you think about it. Think back through the Bible stories that you know and all the heroes of faith and people like that. When he creates Adam, there's just Adam. There's only one guy, he's there alone. And then he says, well, it's not really good for you, so he makes Eve to be with him. But we need a relationship with God and then Maybe we can share with others. But first, you need that relationship with God. Alone time can be useful. God talks to Moses from the burning bush when Moses has just sheep. Another wilderness story, right? Apparently, Abraham is alone when God talks to him then. Gideon at the wine press. Saul when he's blind for three days. He makes him alone. I mean, he's in a group of people and he makes him where, okay, you can't see anything anymore. And if you think about the time of Israel in the wilderness and the comparison between what happened with Israel and the wilderness is they're led out to that wilderness and as Jesus is in the wilderness, Jesus is tempted there. And his statement is, I live by the word of God. He wouldn't even make his own bread after 40 days. And the first thing Israel does is cry for bread and then complain about it and say, not good enough, we want water. Not good enough, we want meat. Not good enough, we want, we want, we want. And we never learn to live on what God has and what God gives. The second thing from Jesus is God will keep you safe. You don't need to test him. You don't need to check it out. And Israel gives up and wants to go back to Egypt so many times. Every battle, when they get and send spies in, they're always afraid of being where they are because we don't trust God. And they think that a life of torture would be better. The third one for Jesus is the mission is to be done God's way. You worship him only. You don't worship anybody else. It is only God. And Israel's waiting for the law and they make themselves a golden calf. What? 40 days? We've got to wait for Moses to come back down? Forget that. We can make our own God. They couldn't let God's plan work enough to follow it. And they rebelled so often. They even tried idolatry, and that never seemed to work. And so you can see this over and over again as, as people mess up their alone time with God, and they mess up their relationship with God, and it, it never turns out well for them. It never ends up where it's supposed to be. And so what are the things that we need to do when we're alone? Well, for one that we've already talked about, when you're alone, the devil might come to you and there might be temptation that happens. 
There could be a time like that where you're going to be tempted and where somebody's going to, you know, show you something that maybe you want to do and you have to say, no, I can't do this. It is a battle with the devil and we need to be strong and stand up to him. But the second thing is you might need to be alone with yourself. You ever done that? And then decided you don't like the company? Maybe we need to be alone with ourselves enough to get to say, you know what, I don't like who I am. Maybe I should be better about who I am. And be a nice enough person where you enjoy being with yourself because after all, you're a good person. Because God's made you good. God has done so many things to allow his spirit to live in you. He's redeemed you. He's forgiven you. There's grace that's always there. And it's not a matter of saying, well, I'm a pretty terrible person. No, God's given you every opportunity to make you into a great person that is a blessing to everybody else, including the time that you have when you're just with yourself. And the third one is there's a time with God. A time when you can just communicate with him and a time when you can read what he has to say and you can listen for his voice and what does he want to be done. And sometimes, like with Jesus, it's, it's just be there. Get through 40 days. I think that's where David writes Psalms as he's out with sheep and there's nothing to do with sheep. And he talks to God. And he writes a few of those thoughts down. And it's where our praise comes from. It's where all of those blessings come from as we relate to God and as we understand how to be alone with God. Because your worship shouldn't just be when you come here. If all of us have that great relationship with God and have brought his blessings into our life and his grace and his forgiveness and we we're okay with ourselves and we're okay with God and we're great with, with all of this. When we come together, how fantastic is that? And the fourth one that's best for alone time is just prayer. I mean, we need to be able to talk to God and sometimes just tell him some things and maybe listen for an answer when he can talk back to us, when he's able to say things to us. We'll talk more about prayer and, and some of the other things that happen when you're alone and how all of that works. Jesus spends time on the mountaintop talking to God because that's where you are. But I think one of the best things maybe for alone time is this parable of Jesus in Luke 13. It gives us a chance to do better. It gives us a chance to say, I'm not done where I am, but there's a chance to do better. It says, and he told this parable, a man had a fig tree in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? He answered him, sir... Let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and I put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Simple parable. No fruit for th three years straight. Well, who plants a fig tree in a vineyard anyway? I mean, didn't he plant it in the wrong spot? It's in the middle of his vineyard. I don't understand that part or know why that is, but, you know, he decides, well, if there's no fruit, you might as well cut it down. Did the fig tree know he was serious? No figs. Not a single one in sight. It has nice big leaves. There are fig trees around in Arizona. You may have seen one. Some people have figs that are eaten by birds, and some people have no figs. Because that's the choice, either figs eaten by birds or no figs, seems to be the, the way that it goes around here. But he says, let's give the fig tree a chance. Okay, how we do that? You leave it alone. Now, I understand he's not really 
drawing that parallel here, but I think it just fits so well. He says, I will give it everything it needs in order to grow. We will dig around and aerate the soil. We will give it the fertilizer it needs. We will give it the water it needs. And if it doesn't grow, cut it down. I agree. But what we do in the meantime is we leave it alone. Let it develop. Give it everything it needs to be great. But then expect something to happen. I know this one gets after me too. There is no alone where there are no consequences for doing nothing. You are not alone to do nothing. You are alone to be with God. It is not doing nothing, being nothing, becoming nothing, just alone. That doesn't exist. It's a time when you're able to be with God. And it gives us a chance to come to God. I need to get alone with God and quiet my desire for the world's feedback so I can hear His voice. Because sometimes there are so many things shouting at you. So much work that's all around you. So many relationships that are all around you. And all of the duties and demands of life are just overwhelming until you don't have time to be alone at all. You don't have time to think even. And so maybe that's what you need. It's just a few minutes to be alone and give you a chance to talk with God. So that we can have the love of God and then show that to somebody else. Because until you've had it put in your life, you can't really show it to anybody else. That we can believe in the power of God and let that power be seen in our life. So that we can share that with somebody else and not be afraid. So that we can put ourselves last. And that we are not important. So that we learn how to live by the word of God and by what God says. Being alone might be the best chance you've got to do better. Because that's the place where you can work on it. And so maybe you need to find some alone time. Time to get with God. You're never without Him. Don't make Him have to blind you for three days. To get you alone. Maybe you need to find that. If you know that place where God is, then give it some time. It's easier to repent then. It's easier to talk to God then. It's easier to pray then. It's easier to see yourself then. Because I think it all begins there, doesn't it? It all starts there with being able to hear his voice and what he says. And being able to make that covenant with him as we repent and are baptized into Christ and receive his spirit and receive his grace and his redemption. And then we join with all the other people. What an amazing thing it is. How's your relationship with God today? I, I know you're probably not alone here and we'll talk about that next week. Maybe you are alone here. And yeah, that's next week. We don't have that much time today, but boy, if we can pray for you, if we can help you connect with God. That's what we want to do today. Would you come while we stand and sing?